Uh, Alex, to you, first of all, tell us a little bit about what you've seen since you arrived there. Well, pretty much in the centre of Derna, quite near the port, and everywhere you look here, it's 360 degrees destruction. You can look behind me. We're actually, where we're standing is the first floor of a nine-storey block of flats. It's just been levelled. Behind me are many more blocks of flats, all pancaked, smashed out the way. You can just see the foundations left here. The force of the water was so strong from the two dams that collapsed, which Yusra will show you in a minute, that it actually sounded like, the, the locals saying it sounded like explosion after explosion after explosion. Massive tons of rocks, whole apartment blocks just swept away. You can see the foundations of an entire bridge. There are three bridges that have just been swept away. Tons of rocks have been lifted up and moved. Part of the bridge has been moved, some 700 metres. The whole of the road has been swept away. There are building after building which has been levelled or smashed through. They had, according to those who survived, about 20 minutes to get out of the way of this torrent of water. You can see again another bridge, just the foundations sticking up out of the way. That is, to the left of the bridge, is the uh, Saba Mosque, one of the most religious sites in eastern Libya, certainly the most significant religious Islamic site here in Derna. The whole of the front has been upended. You can't see it anymore. And it's been moved about five, uh, 50 metres to a completely different location. And we're finding vehicles upended in trees against uh, buildings. The number of people who have died here is still just not known. We, we've seen clusters of volunteers, relatives basically, who are searching for their loved ones. Just to the, to the right of where we are, they think there are about 14 missing people. Um, a building's already been marked with an orange marking which shows that they think there are some uh, dead people, much of the imagination to know that there's so many scars here that don't even look reminiscent of buildings. There are probably, well, dozens, maybe more than that, of people's bodies they haven't yet recovered. And there are still more than 10,000 people missing, Anna. Well, yes, the scale of this disaster is unimaginable, Alex. Is there any help coming in for these people? We've been here uh, overnight. We drove through the night to get here. We managed to plot a route, uh, had the help of, a, of um, a, a local, but remember, most of us are, are pretty much strangers to this area. The road was clear. We managed to get through. There is no sign of any significant international aid here at all. There is very little evidence of any Libyan um, aid workers. We've seen some military uh, activity, some soldiers, like I would say a handful so far, um, which we saw going through, a couple of soldiers just going through um, buildings. Uh, most of the people we've seen are civilians and they are in shock, staring, or they're wandering around and they've targeted a particular building where they know relatives or friends lived and they're armed with pickaxes and shovels to try to find evidence of what happened to, to their relatives of loved one. And you'll notice uh, that we've noticed that a lot of them are wearing masks because there's quite a strong smell in the air of, um, of, of corpses. And a lot of people here feel that this was a disaster that started as a natural disaster with Storm Daniel, but that had, they had plenty of warning about Storm Daniel. We saw it cutting its way through a number of Mediterranean uh, countries before it hit here in eastern Libya. And then on top of that, there was a, 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 a catastrophic uh, culmination of human error where they had preparation, they could have warned, they could have got people out of this city, out of the way, and instead they didn't. That was the first error. The second one was two dams collapsed 
and that happened because they hadn't been looked after for many, many years. But uh, my colleague Yusha will tell you more about that later on in the programme. Well, yes, and, and just before we do go to, to Yusra, uh, who can describe the scene near where that dam was breached, uh, give us an idea of what people are saying to you there. The scale of their need is enormous. I mean, seriously, these are people who are doing it very much on their own. You've got, you can see little patches of groups of people wandering around. This is a, this is a city. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine. People were living here, working just a week ago, um, enjoying life. It's, it looks like someone's just picked up the middle of the city and just smashed it on the ground. Every building around that I can see has been affected in some way. Uh, and just imagine, in every one of these buildings you see collapsed, there were hundreds of people living and thriving and, and working. So where are they, apart from those who have died, and there are clearly thousands, what about those who have somehow survived? Where are they now living? Where have they gone? They're utterly displaced, and there's, there must be a huge number of them. And a lot of the responsibility is being placed on the in terribly poor infrastructure, the poor governance, the corruption, the splitting of the, the country into two militia-supported uh, authorities. One, one is supported by the UN. And decades of problems which lead back to the 2011 NATO-backed invasion of Libya and the ousting of Colonel Gaddafi, which has had a knock-on effect on this, this country and reduced it to a basket case. 